Welcome, everybody. Well, what are friends for? In the, the book, The Tangible Past of Athens, Milton Leathers poses that question and answers it with, well, the book itself is one reason for friends. In fact, all these essays and the 650 pages of the book were a direct result of friends getting together over countless brown bag lunches to talk about their favorite subject, the history of Athens, Georgia. In 2010, um, the project began as, as I understand it, an essay about moved houses in Athens, Georgia. Well, soon it evolved into what was to be a slim volume that was covered a little more about Athens architecture. Um, but these 13 authors, historians, researchers, uh, and their wide circle of friends and acquaintances kept finding unique stories and photographs that just had to be included. And that's why we have such a large volume today. Um, but they also built on the research of um, earlier citizens, in particularly the um, 1906 Annals of Athens and by Dr. Henry Hull and his son, Augustus Longstreet Hull. And they mined the resources of the athens Clark County Heritage Room and the Hargret Special Collections Library of the University of Georgia. Um, but and even during the arduous indexing process undertaken by Charlotte, who calls herself editor by default, by the way. <laughs> um, and Gary Doster and Milton Leathers, a few more things were even added during that process to make it a more enlightening book. I first learned of this project about two, year, two summers ago when I asked Milton, well, what, what had he been doing lately? <laughs> and I knew I'd get an interesting response, but this was great. Milton <clears throat> was on the advisory board of the national leadership grant that the athens Clark County Library and the Linden House Art Center had. And so soon Milton uh, helped us to develop a program where we had Charlotte and Gary Doster, Stephen Brown from the Hargret Special Collections Library, um, and of course Charlotte, and they told about the process of making this book, and it was um, not quite finished at that point. And you can watch this program because it's archived on the website rslathens.org. Um, <clears throat> now, you may not remember that, but you can find the link to that website on the front page of the athens Clark County website, and it's very entertaining as well as informative. Also, today's um, show, or today's program, is going to be archived on that same uh, website. So if you know friends who couldn't come today, then you can refer them to the website. Um, the leadership grant is now over, but the athens Clark County Library is continuing the program, and they're calling it Reflecting Sharing Learning, or RSL for short. And Van Burns, who's taping down here, is uh, steering that project. Well, Charlotte has been soaking up history about Athens for a long time. And she is also the author of Historic Houses of Athens and the Oconee uh, Hill Cemetery, Volume 1. She writes three essays in this book, is the editor, and helped to uh, spearhead this index, which is very thick. I counted the number of pages, but now I've forgotten. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and before I turn the program over to Charlotte, I'd like to express the appreciation of a lot of us in Athens to Charlotte and all the other researchers and writers and friends of theirs who added to this volume, because this labor of love will really enrich our community now and for many generations to come. Thank you all.
Well, this has truly been a season of Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all other celebratory holidays, and I want to thank you because you have received this book with open arms, and it's just made all of us so happy because we did labor over it, but first we had so much fun meeting. You can't imagine what a heady experience it was to sit around the table with these people all of whom know different things about Athens past. We all had different mentors, and we each knew that we had learned things from these mentors that had never been written down, and we felt a moral responsibility to write them down. I hope we have. We've written down a lot of words, I know that. <laughs> and and we've, we thought we knew what we were doing uh, in the fall of 2011, when after almost a year and a half of meeting, we thought we were ready to write the book. Looking back now to that point, it is truly amazing what we learned in the interim between the fall of 2011 and September of 2014, when the book went to press. We were still learning things in early September and having to part the waters of the Red Sea to put it in. And this book is a beautiful production, thanks to Ken Story, who won't come sit on the stage with us. He said <laughs> He's done a masterful job of formatting the book, designing all elements of it, and then after he would finish with an essay, suddenly a picture or a piece of information would fall into our laps and I would say, Ken, can you? And there was always a smile and he did it. He is, if anybody's going to be doing a book, and you need somebody to work with you, you couldn't have a finer person than Ken's story. And he took many of the pictures in the book. When we first thought it was going to be a very slim volume, Gary Dosta was quite worried about how slim it was going to be. <laughs> and he was going around looking for uh, images to illustrate the book, and we are in great debt to Gary for the images that he has provided from his extensive private collection and that he led us to otherwise. And Gary has all, you know him for his postcard books, but his collections have great depth and breadth and our book is much finer because of those things. Uh, also, we vowed in the beginning that we were going to give you new pictures with this book, pictures that you had never seen before. And we went to individuals who had their grandmother's photograph albums, and they let us borrow them and copy those pictures. Marie Hodson Koenig is just one of those people, and the book is just much richer. You will enjoy the pictures we copied out of her book. Then in June of this year, I got an email from the Welcome Center saying that a descendant of the Deering family was coming to town and wanted to see all the houses that the Deerings had built. And I was just really in a crush of editing at that time, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't have time to even think about all the houses, but if he will meet me at Oconee Hills Cemetery at four o'clock in the afternoon. I will show him where they're buried. <laughs> <laughs> that I knew off the top of my head. So he did. And when we finished looking at all the grave sites, he said, I brought the family Bible with me. And it was one of those uh, old Bibles that had carte de visites in the back of it. And there was a photograph of the portrait of William Deering, who built this stately house, uh, sort of a Milledgeville Federal house that once stood on Thomas Street. And I was, I'd never seen William Deering's likeness. It wasn't available to us in Athens. And I said, 
If you can give me a digital image of that in the next 10 days, I'll get it in the book. And again, Ken parted the waters, <laughs> and we got William Deering in the book. Uh, just all sorts of things like that happened, and Teresa's going to tell you something else that happened that blew all of our minds. And it, that essay was so far uh, formatted that we had to crunch all of this into the cut line of a picture, but we, we gave you the information. I'm going to let the rest of them tell you uh, different things and read you different things from what they've done. Um, but I want you to know that the heritage room of this library meant ever so much to us and our research. It's so easy to drive up to this library and go to the heritage room and uh, use all the different kinds of materials that are available to us to research there. I have done many of a chain of title and deeds for these houses there, and everybody's so helpful. Um, from years, I, I started spending a lot of time there when I was working on the Oconee Hill book, and just sitting there churning the microfilm newspaper, which is what I had to do back then. Now it's digitized, and I can do it at home, most of it. But I would hear Laura Williams Carter and all of her staff telling all these various researchers coming in how to solve their problems. And I, people use the word odd and awesome so easily these days, but I don't. And I just want you to know that when I say I was awed by what the librarians in the Heritage Room told these visitors, who came in trying to find out something, I was truly awed because the depth of their understanding of the materials and how to find an answer to something is truly inspiriting to me. So you ought to come use the Heritage Room. And if you aren't already a friend of the library, join me in being a friend of the library. The library deserves every friend it can get. And I, having lived in other communities, I am so impressed with the use of this library, all the different kinds of programs that this library offers, all the different populations that it draws. It, it is a stimulating place. So I will quit talking at this point, and we're going to let Milton talk a while. And people said, well, now, Charlotte, when you give Mike Milton the microphone, how are you going to get it back? <laughs> and I said, when he's talked long enough, I'm going to get up and hug him. <laughs> and Milton does a clock back there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, we have been trying really to decide uh, what to do. We don't want any profits because um, Charlotte doesn't want to be in business. We're sort of thinking what to do with uh, if we do make profits, and maybe we should give it to the Heritage Room so it can stay open more often. <laughs> <laughs> I hope somebody brought a book because I've got to read from it. <laughs> maybe I'll, thank you, Stephen. And look, the that without the uh, dust jacket, it's so good looking. And speaking of the dust jacket, all of you look for uh, Reuben Nickerson in the dust jacket. He's standing in his garden, but he's pretty hard to see. Can I close this? Stephen? No. Ask Charlotte. I don't know. Oh, well, I'll just close it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we found out. Well, what I'm going to do is read something. Uh, Madeline pretty much trumped my uh, in, uh, introduction, but I'm going to read the opening paragraph and maybe um, a little more and then a couple of excerpts. I hope I don't have to read as fast as I did at Harvard because Lee Epstein was leaving town and he said if I wasn't finished it in seven and a half minutes, he was walking out the door because he was following me. So Charlotte said I can read more slowly today. <laughs> This is the, from the introduction. On May 10th, uh, first of all, is there a young lady named Chana here? Well, I'm disappointed. My, Athens has always attracted interesting people uh, since its inception and continues to, I always say that Athens is the kind of place where you become, a, become an Athenian because Athens has always welcomed newcomers with talent and we've always had 
of course because of the university. So we've always attracted these interesting people. And we have a wonderful new woman in town from San Francisco, and her, her, her real name is China, but her nickname's China, if you can catch the difference, not, not, not much. But I think she, more than choosing Athens, she chose my nephew, Hunt Leathers, but she lives here now, she likes Athens. She chose Athens over San Francisco, so there you go. <laughs> Here's our introduction. Uh, on May 10th, 1793, a few recent arrivals on the Oconee River at the Cedar Shoals, where an ancient Cherokee and Creek Trail crossed the waterway and where Athens and the University of Georgia would soon rise, petitioned Governor Edward Telfair to build a blockhouse, quote, for the preservation of this settlement. Athenians have come together ever since to ensure this goal. One might say that this very volume, The Tangible Past in Athens, Georgia, is another effort on the part of our citizens to tell the story of the preservation of that settlement. Over 200 years after its beginning, our outpost in the salubrious climate of the Piedmont, a lot of you will know that the Senatus Academicus wanted to get away from the miasma of the coast, the miasmatic coast, and, and go up to the salubrious climate of the Piedmont. Sometimes on an August afternoon, I said, gee, pretty salubrious up here today, isn't it? <laughs> In our salubrious outpost uh, climate of the Piedmont, it has grown from some hardy adventurers near the then western boundary of the United States on Indian lands into a diverse and appealing city approaching a population of 125,000, known nationally and beyond for its vibrancy, erudition, and good living. During his thousand mile walk to the Gulf in 1867, naturalist John Muir passed through Athens. In this Scotsman's diary, he called Athens, quote, a remarkably beautiful and aristocratic town containing many classic and magnificent mansions, unmistakable marks of culture and refinement as well as wealth were everywhere apparent. This is the most beautiful town I have seen on the journey so far and the only one in the South I would like to revisit. The tangible past attempts to tell part of the story of how we got from that fledgling settlement without its first fort to a city of such stature. And the final paragraph is Athens' late beloved nonagenarian, University Professor Emeritus George O. Marshall, Jr., whose relic is here beside me. <laughs> That's what they used to say in the wills, relic of George O. Marshall. What's that? Pat. Pat McAlexander, come up. You got a seat for you. Oh, Pat Cooper. I saw Pat Wall. Oh, I, I told you I didn't have my glasses. <laughs> Hubert McAlexander's not here, is he? No. Pat no. Cooper, you come up, please. No. Sound like the price is right. Come on up. <laughs> oh, Lord. Lee, Lee Epson is, is uh, about halfway through the project, started calling Charlotte boss lady. Yeah, boss lady. Yes, I'm boss lady. The final paragraph, Athens late beloved nonagenarian, University English professor emeritus George O. Marshall, Jr., often remarked, the written word remains. The dedication of this volume salutes Dr. Henry Hull and his son, Augustus Longstreet Hull, the writers of the indispensable 1906 Annals of Athens, which, by the way, is being reprinted at 20 or $25, and every Athenian should own this copy, and Mary Claire Bonnert Warren is about to come out with it. When, Mary Claire? It's in a truck. It's in a truck. <laughs> I remember when I was in business, that didn't mean much, but <laughs> it will be here. It's a wonderful volume and uh, beautifully reprinted with a wonderful uh, uh, expanded index and everyone should own this. If you know someone that moves to Athens and give it to all your children, they may not read it now, but they'll read it later. Uh, we're dedicated, dedicating this to Henry Hull and his son Augustus Longstreet Hull, the writers of Annals of Athens. We declare these men delightful and trustworthy. They are that. The contributors to the tangible past have aspired to build on the work done by these two earlier citizens and hope to succeed in making an enjoyable coming together of friends into another valuable written word that remains, a book that will stand and continue for years and years to be a delightful and trustworthy resource for anyone interested in Athens, Georgia. And I'm gonna read a little from my essay, from my chapter, which is 25 Cobb Houses in Athens. And uh, I did it based on a chart, which I brought it down just only people that made the chart were ones that left a house worth talking about. But um, 
I started to bring it down another generation into my grandfather's generation and uh, Chad Irwin and Lucy Irwin Allen's generation, George Irwin, their, their grandfathers. And I could have had about 32 or 33 houses. And one day, uh, Charlotte Marshall told, told Pete McCommon, said, Milton's at home trying to decide how many cobs make an essay. <laughs> and Pete McCommon said, good God, that's like asking an alcoholic how many ounces make a drink. <laughs> But anyway, I'm going to read uh, a little bit from the first page of this one. Over the years, quite a few structures in Athens, Georgia have been called the Cobb House. These days, we hear or read an announcement such as the upcoming meeting will be at the Cobb House. This probably means the TRR Cobb House recently restored on Hill Street at Prince Avenue as a museum. The reader will find a very interesting essay by Sam Thomas on this residence in the pages of our book. Sam? No? Sam? Yeah. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous used to meet at the Cobb House at the top of Polk Street. This is the 1835 house built by my great-great-grandfather that is again a private residence, having been recently refurbished by young Christopher Peterson and his bride. And I go on down at, at Millage and Lumpkin, there used to be a, 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 a sign over a house said the Cobb House. This was the home and base of operations for the legendary caterers, Ms. H.H. H. Cobb. Members of this Athens family, though from a Massachusetts branch of the English Cobbs and unrelated to our Cobbs in this essay, at least on this side of the Atlantic, have been friends with our Cobbs for generations in our city. Down Lumpkin, across from the Georgia Center, there's a sign that says the Cobb House. That's uh, next to the trainer house. I've heard announcements on uh, the radio that uh, a play was being performed at Sini Sobol Chapel next to the Cobb House. That was not a house, that's Lucy Cobb Institute. <laughs> The Navy Supply Corps School, before leaving us for Rhode Island, uh, acquired Quarters A. This was a uh, house that was built by a woman with the improbable, na improbable name of Olivia Newton Cobb, and uh, that has served as Quarters A for the Navy School for years. This plethora of Cobb houses has created no small amount of confusion among Athenians, at least among ones who might be trying to make sense of their town's history. So. Um, I'm going to jump quickly to a couple of things here. How long do I have, Charlotte? Minute. One more, one minute? Another minute or two. Another minute or two. I know what that means. <laughs> um, I want to tell the story about asking uh, my uh, mother's favorite first cousin, uh, Hal Irwin, if asking his widow if their house could be on tour at the end of Deering Street. Um, Cousin, cousin Howell's wife was born, born Corinne Chadwick Stevens, but called Bobby, uh, an irrepressible lady. I asked her once if she could um, have her house on the spring tour of homes. She answered, who would want to see our house? Bobby asked me. We don't even have heat upstairs. <laughs> and I don't think I can get ready in time anyway, but I pressed her. People from the Heritage Found Foundation will come to help you get ready, I advised. And besides, uh, Helen and Sapolo Trainer on Lumpkin Street and that uh, Cobb House said they would do it. And Cammie, my wife, has agreed to open our house at Hill and Harris. That makes three Cobb Houses for the tour. Bobby agreed. I saw her in Five Points just about two weeks before the tour. She said, I could kick you. <laughs> Bobby declared, what? Didn't people from the Heritage Foundation come to help you? Bobby regained her composure and said, well, yes, but there's some things you really have to do yourself. No one will do those kinds of things for you. I am worn out. I tried to console her. Well, my goodness, Bobby, look at it this way. Sapolo Trainer died. It was true. Between my asking and the house to the 91-year-old University of Georgia and Paris Sorbonne-trained Dr. Sapolo Trainer did pass away. Bobby looked at me and finished the conversation and took the easy way out. <laughs> This was one about my great aunt, who was gone all afternoon in 1915. Uh, my grandfather, Irwin, had a driver, had a, not because he was rich, but because he couldn't drive, and a, a driver in a car, and he, he picked up Mamie, and nobody knew where Mamie was. Mamie was born with the name Mary Ann Lamar Cobb Irwin, my grandfather's oldest sister. They said her, her, her initials lack in one letter spell malice. <laughs> and no one knew where Mamie and the car were, and the driver. Finally, around dusk, my grandfather's Maxwell automobile and driver pulled up to 524 Hill Street, where Brenda Blanton's office is on Millington Hill. Out of the back came Mamie. 
Her brothers were in the yard playing. Sister, where in the world have you been all day? They asked. Mamie replied, I went to see that new picture show, Birth of a Nation. I sat through it three times. The boys were surprised. One said, but that's the longest picture show ever made. How could you do that? It isn't long, Mamie agreed, but it is wonderful. I just sat there because I kept wanting to get back to that part where they shot Lincoln. <laughs> ah, well, we can be thankful that such hard feelings in the South have passed, mostly. <laughs> and my last uh, piece is about uh, one of my favorite people, Nell Hodson Watt in Atlanta. Um, uh, Aunt Lollipop, how many of you remember Aunt Lollipop that lived on, on Deering? And she had a sister, Lydia, who married Morton Hodson, and they had four children. And um, Lydia had married the Athenian Morton Hodson. Moton Hodson, we said, white and black alike said Moton. Moton Hodson. At different times, this couple lived in two other houses in this essay. Mr. Hodson's sister, Nell, was the wife of Robert Woodruff the all-powerful head of the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta. As the Hodson children arrived, the first was named Morton Jr., the second was named Hutchins Hodson, the third, another son, was named Robert for Uncle Bob Woodruff, since he and Nell Hodson Woodruff had no children or namesakes. Our grandfather, Andrew Irwin, thought that this naming was a good and appropriate honor for the Atlantan. When a baby girl finally arrived, Lydia named her Nell, again honoring the Woodruffs. A month or so after this child's arrival, Granddaddy saw Lydia in downtown Athens. He congratulated her again, but added, Ye guys, cousin Lydia, you might as well have named them delicious and refreshing. Milton has gotten us off to a roaring start, and I think I ought to pause and officially introduce those up here on the podium, starting with Amy, whose full name is Amelia Monroe Andrews, and she will be uh, reading to you later, Gary Doster, and Stephen Brown, and my cousin, Sam Thomas, who's the curator of the Thomas R. R. Cobb House, and Milton introduced me to Sam as soon as he got to town and we just commented about the fact that my maiden name was Thomas and in no time Sam's father established the fact that we are indeed related back <laughs> in revolutionary days. And Sam provided us a home to meet and we had been meeting in different restaurants and we finally got too large and the restaurant noise interfered with our talking. <laughs> and so Sam invited us to the Thomas R. R. Cobb house and there we could meet in quiet and just to our heart's content and that's how this book got born and we thank you for giving us a home, Sam. Next is Teresa Flynn, who is a marvelous researcher. When we started this book, she was on the staff in the Heritage Room, and she helped any number of us there. And then later, uh, after she had retired from that job, I needed an editor for my bookends essay because Gary Doster read it, and he said, Charlotte, there are too many people in this essay. <laughs> And I said, well, Gary, if it weren't for people, there would be no need for houses. And he said, yes, but you've got too many people. You've got to do something. And so Teresa is really an astute editor. If you ever need a good editor, she ought to charge top dollar, though. <laughs> she, she is great. And uh, she, she found <coughs> things that she's going to tell you about that were truly amazing uh, in developing the book. Then next is Mary Bondurant Warren, who is my mentor. Back when I was told in 1970 that it would be my job to research the history of the Taylor Grady House, I said to my husband, how can they tell me to do that? I don't do research. <laughs> but um, I did it, and Mary Claire very graciously acquainted me with what she knew about the Taylor Grady house and the Taylors and the Grady's and others who had owned it and became my friend and I wouldn't give anything for that friendship, a very supportive one. And uh, she agreed with Hubert 
uh, when he was the initial editor of this work, that we could reuse an essay that she had written for the Athens Historian some years ago. And then I really badgered her into writing her big essay for this book because I liked this house that I saw in a picture of the double barrel cannon and never was the name of that house printed. I didn't, couldn't learn anything about it. and just happened to mention it in her presence one day and she said, oh, that belonged to my ancestor's sister. And so learning that, I just forced her to write this essay, which you're gonna be so happy to read when you see it. Then there's Lee Epting who has the hill. And you just don't know what a joy it is to meet with Lee and hear all of his stories and to get to learn about how the hill grew. And I am so fascinated by the fact that he regards his hill as an orphanage for houses which have lost their home. <laughs> now, isn't that a beautiful concept? We don't have that elsewhere in preservation. And Pat Cooper, has a very scholarly essay on those Yankees named Pick, who came here in the 1820s and built a number of houses. We are finding out there were even more than we originally knew about, and that there are vestiges of them somewhere else today that have been moved from Athens. Uh, and Milton not only uh, wrote the introduction at my request, but he and did that wonderful Cobb essay. It's, there are really more than 25 houses in it, and I said, Milton, don't you want to change the number to reflect the actual number of houses you're writing about? And he said, no, I like the number 25. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it is. Um, and Milton has stood by me, and Gary Doss to have, in editing and indexing, so is Mary Claire. And, um, I, and it as you know, it takes a village to do things. It's not just those of us who have written the essays and the others who were contributors, but there are others <coughs> whose name aren't on this book. And one of them is sitting in the very back of the room, and she did this chart for Milton when he started figuring out exactly how many Cobb houses. And she is also my go-to person when I can't find it. And that is Mary Claire's oldest daughter, Eve Warren Mays. <laughs> now, there are others of us who aren't present today. And first and foremost, I want to mention Hubert McAlexander, whose idea this book originally was. On May the, sometimes you can actually date when something began, and this began on May the 1st, 2010, at a meeting, when Hubert got me by the hand and said, Charlotte, you must write a book about moved houses. And I said, Hubert, I don't know enough to write a book. But he, he would not let go of the idea. This was right after he had had strokes and had to retire officially from the university. And so I went home and called Milton and I said, Hubert is interested in moved houses. Why don't we get some people together to discuss this? So he got Marianne Hodson and Henry Ramsey and we started off meeting and we invited others. And see, we aren't an official group. Nobody appointed us. We are self-appointed. We are freewheeling. Uh, <laughs> and let me tell you, when it came to editing, Free wheeling still applied. Uh, the majority of us are senior citizens and pay no attention to guidelines, deadlines, or any other thing. <laughs> it's been a real survival course. But we came out with something wonderful, and I call it a chorus of voices. Another person who is not with us, we lost two years ago, was uh, Mary Ann Martin Hodson. And what great contributions she made to this book. She has three essays, one of which nobody else could have written at that time. It is the reuse of architectural elements. And she tells about 
the things that were taken out of these antebellum homes and saved and then reused in uh, houses built in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. A r beautiful essay, and Ken took most of the pictures to illustrate that, and one Patricia Cooper had made in the 1970s, uh, a mantelpiece that we couldn't easily get to today, that was saved originally from Cars Hill. And that mantelpiece has made a journey all around Athens. It, you know, things are very portable. Um, and I'm, I'm not naming one. Oh, Pete McCommons. Uh, for those of you who have been loyal readers of the Athens Observer, you may remember his photo essay, The Tour You'll Never Take, which was mainly pictures of houses that were no longer extant. We asked him to replicate that in this book. And so he agreed to do it, and he was figuring out how he could do it in a book format when he took Amy Andrews' walk uh, for the Athens Clark Heritage Foundation of Prince Avenue. And he was so impressed with her knowledge that he invited her to join him and confine the uh, essay to Prince Avenue. And that is now called Vanished Prince Avenue. And uh, it finally became so involved that it took three more of us to finish it. And uh, Pete said, well, after all, it is the longest street in town. <laughs> and I never had thought about it in that regard. Pete can't be with us uh, today. He's out of town for the weekend. But it, it's been a joy working with all of these people and learning from them. And next, I will call on um, Mary Claire to come up. And she is coming in the persona of the woman who wrote the letters in the view from the top of the hill. This is the daughter of Mary Claire's ancestor's sister. This is Julia Pope Stanley, called Jewel. And Mary Claire, I'll let you tell more about Jewel and the letters. <coughs> I was born in 1824. Julia Ann Tabitha Pope, the daughter of General Burwell Pope, who commanded the forces in Georgia and Florida during the War of 1812, and Sarah Key Strong. Both of their parents had emigrated from Virginia, and so we were along Virginia ancestors. They settled in Wilkes County eventually in Oldthorpe County and Clark County. Our home, the Burwell Pope Place, was called Pope's Station because the train went through my father's property. We were in Oglethorpe County, and in the family were seven sons and myself. The house was lively. <laughs> When the brothers went off to college, they decided to send me off as well. And so I went to Wesleyan Seminary in Macon, Georgia, something that very few women in my era were allowed to do. I became a teacher, and in 1854 married another teacher, Marcella Stanley. We made our home in the house at the top of the hill Mother had bought it after my father died in 1848. She left the plantation in Oglethorpe County and moved to town while the younger boys were going to the university. And so Marcellus and I had our two children in the house at the top of the hill. Sarah Pope Stanley was named for my mother, and Thomas Stanley was named for my father's, my, my husband's father. Tommy was born in 1860, and all he knew was war. Sally was born in 1855 and came up through the hell that was the Civil War. We were doing fine until the war started, and suddenly my husband and four brothers 
were in Confederate service. They left immediately. He for Virginia and my brothers for Mississippi and Florida. The only way we could keep up was through letters, and the letters were very erratic. <clears throat> Hard times came, and rumors, rumors circulated, but facts did not. And so I'm sure that some of my letters must have hurt my husband to receive them when he was not here to help. He was in Florida with Howard Cobb's unit most of the Civil War. And here is an example. August the 5th, 1864, my dear husband, we have all been in a perfect whirl of excitement this week. The report came that the enemy in a large force was at the High Shoals advancing on Athens. I didn't believe it until Mr. Wright came in and said they were at our breastworks. Somehow that did not alarm me so much, but they did not come. Only a reconnoitering party came to the hill beyond the paper mill. Ed Lumpkin threw a ball among them and they fled. Sure they did, because the bridge flooring had been taken up. <laughs> The main body were in Watkinsville getting something to eat, but they all fled when the party from here returned. They were a part of Stoneman's command trying to get back to Sherman. Sherman was in uh, surrounding Atlanta at the time. Colonel McGill received a dispatch from General Iverson asking that the enemy might be kept at bay until the force that was in pursuit could come up. They were overtaken in the night while asleep by about a hundred of the pursuing Confederate party and 400 Yankees captured, but about half made their escape. The remainder were brought here to the campus and the people have made a show of them. Nearly everybody in town and the country came to look at them. They had to be sent off this morning to Andersonville prison. I suppose they are now gone but we have given our men a big dinner today at the chapel. The drum is beating now, and I suppose they're going in to dinner. Everybody in town nearly is at the campus except myself. One of the Confederate soldiers is here sick. I think he is broke down. They have been after the Raiders two days, and for two nights they have had no sleep and very little to eat. Tommy says, tell Papa to make haste and come home. I do hope you will come soon, and yet I'm afraid for you to come too. It has been said that the Yanks took old George Jarrell prisoner the other day and hung him, but I don't know whether to believe it or not. I've not received a letter from you since today last week. May the Lord bless and be with you. Yours affectionate, Jew. Mary Claire copied that letter in the 1960s during the centennial of the Civil War. And it was in the Hargrit Library. And aren't we glad that she made those typescripts? This was before you could run photocopy things. And anyway, the family wasn't going to let it out of the house. So she took her portable typewriter and made that copy. And uh, she has. And all of these were written from a house that stood where First American Bank now stands. So, see, it is the view from the top of the hill. Now, I want Lee to come tell us about his hill. Now, I don't have to tell the same story I told last time. Why not? No, I got a better one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm sure that we're going to uh, have to have a second volume of this stuff. There's so much stuff we've missed and we've all found. So we're going to get a second volume. Uh, <clears throat> she was talking about the uh, orphanage I have on, and we call it the Hill. It's out uh, Prince Avenue, Jefferson Road on the left there. 
And I got the land, and I had a family home place I wanted to save and move here from South Carolina, and I didn't have any place to do it. So uh, I was able to purchase, uh, started with five acres and ten acres, and my family wouldn't sell me any land. And I finally talked them into, uh, well, I didn't talk them into anything. Uh, I moved the house out there on the land that I bought, and then they decided to sell the land and clear-cut it. And I said, oh, Lord, I can't do that. So I had to buy the family land. And I got the family land. What the heck am I going to do with it? And so I decided to have an office and move other houses in that were in danger. People started calling. And I did that. And uh, then I didn't want to give them up. And I, didn't, and I wanted to buy more antiques. So I get another house and put them in there. And so we have them rented for, you know, parties and, and weddings and things like that and bed and breakfast and whatever. So, that being said, uh, I'm not a scholar. Uh, 90% of what I said is relatively true. Uh, <laughs> but it's all about the story. To me, it's telling the stories, passing it on, and that's what's so important, the stories that go with these houses. And I'm going to tell you a quick story. If it's going to be in the next chapter, I'm sure, or the next book, I'm... Uh, Getting ready, I'd restore the train station, T.K. Hardy's. That was my, one of my first thing in the, in the Southern Railway building down there. And um, I was coming down Prince Avenue looking for stuff, and you're talking about Prince Avenue. And there was the Upson House out there where the bank is, where Athens. What? Sun Trust. Sun Trust now. It's, it, 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 it changes names. But anyway, it was the Upson House. And I go in and I, I meet Miss Upson, and uh, she's telling me about she'd been married there, and she's showing me these wonderful pictures. And it's uh, what they call shabby chic right now, you know, the silk shades on the lamps and all are falling apart, and the furniture's uh, packed up. And she's Miss Upson was living in a couple of rooms downstairs. And I walked in the dining room, and there was a fabulous dining room table with Chippendale chairs, a period of stuff that. Um, I was just drooling over and being in the restaurant business. And I said, Miss Upson, we're going to have to have a dinner here. I will give you a dinner if we could just serve off of this table in this fabulous house. And, and Foss, yeah, it was the Upson house. This is Miss Foss. She was an Upson, right? Yeah. yeah. I told you it's relatively true. <laughs> uh, she was an Upson who had married a Foss, and by now she's a Foss. Okay, she's an Upson Foss. And. Uh, <laughs> So she said, oh, Mr. Epstein, that would just be a wonderful thing to do. Well, time goes on, and uh, the bank uh, is going to buy this house. And uh, Miss Foss calls me and said, Mr. Epstein, you said you wanted to have a dinner, and I would like to have the dinner here for the um, Buddy Milner and, and the bank people and all the things that are going, all the people are going to be involved and to restoring this place and making the new bank out of it. And I would like to have it. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, would you come by and, and, and let's discuss it? So we go by. And she said, now, Mr. Epstein, I think we should, I'm, you know, 30-something years old, mister. And uh, she says, what do you think we should have? And she says, I think we should have, she says, I think we should have lamb. And I said, yes, ma'am, that sounds right. I'd never cooked a piece of lamb in my life. And she said, lamb chops. And you do yours rare, do you not? And I said, yes, ma'am, rare. <laughs> and, and, and I like a mint jelly with chopped up fresh mint. And, yes, ma'am, that's what we do. Yes, ma'am, no problem. And Mr. Ebony, what do you think we should have with the lamb? I like little potatoes. And yes, ma'am. And we went on and on, the potatoes, the beans, <coughs> or the peas, excuse me, peas, crisp peas, and uh, yes, ma'am, with little onions, yes, ma'am. So we planned the whole meal all the way through. All I said was yes, ma'am. And so they get ready to have the dinner, and there are going to be about 20 of them um, that are coming to dinner. And I get a call the day before. They have a big to-do there in the yard. Um, giving Ms. Cobb, <laughs> the one that's not related except over the seas, you know, she brought her little ice cream rounds and her little finger sandwiches. They say she froze what was left over and served them the next week. <laughs> we all do that. Uh, 
So they had this little to do, and the next night they're to have the dinner uh, there at the station. And I mean, in her house at this dining room table. She calls me and said, Mr. Epting, I am just too ill to have all of these people uh, at my house. I said, yes, Miss Foss. Uh, I had the train car uh, at the station. I said, well, we'll have it in the train car. So I go home, get my dining room table, stretch it out down the middle of the train car, and we plan the dinner. Now, her son, Stephen, uh, is coming to the dinner also. So they come to the dinner that night, and I have the rare lamb chops, and I have the peas with the onions, and I have the mint jelly with the mint. I do, and the potatoes and all this. But Miss Foss says she just wasn't up to coming to dinner that night. And that broke my heart, and I wasn't using Chippendale chairs either. But <laughs> we, uh, we had a wonderful dinner, and Stephen got home. Miss Foss had the back left bedroom back there. And Stephen got home about 11.30, and uh, she called him into the room. Well, how was the dinner? Did they have the lamb chops? Were they ready? She went through the whole thing. Yes, Mama, they did this, and he told her. Well, now tell me one more time. He told her one more time. Miss Foss went to bed and did not wake up. She did not have to leave her home there on Prince Avenue. She was to move out the next week. She never had to move. She had her dinner party, and it was a very, very special time in my life to be a part of it. So that's a part of the stories that we will tell in the next chapter uh, about the houses around Athens. So that's now you can read my other stories in the book. Okay, thank you. Well, as you say, Lee doesn't have time to spend in the library because he is busy creating. And in working with him, I have learned that there are just so many facets to Lee Epting. You just don't know if you aren't a real close friend of his. And he is so generous to this community. We are all blessed by his presence. Thank you, Lee. And um, Ms. Foss was one of the first ones blessed. Uh, now, if Amy will come up and share with us some of Prince Avenue. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I've been, I'm a native oh Ohioan, and yay, <laughs> go Buckeyes. But I came here to go to school, and actually I came here long before that. My dad had worked in Reliance Electric in Cleveland and came down here when they started the plant down here and decided to live down here. And so my brother and I would come down when I was 11 years old and, and drive around Athens. And I'm not exactly sure when Prince Avenue kind of entered my consciousness, but um, it was one of the, Normal Town was one of the first places I lived out of when I was in college, and I just was fascinated by Prince Avenue. Um, and seeing the old houses and then seeing these little small one-story brick boxes next to them, and I just wondered what, what had been there before I knew something had to have been there. Um, I became a member of the Athens Park Heritage Foundation, and one of the, the jobs I had there was chairing the Education Committee, and I thought it would be a great idea, and so did Amy Cassane thought that it would be a great idea to have walking tours of Prince Avenue, who has so many historic neighborhoods. And when I visit a new city, that's the first thing I look up on the website, is, is there a walking tour, a food and walking tour especially. Um, and I thought Prince Avenue would be a great location for that because there's, I'm sure there were stories that needed to be uncovered. And I followed the, um, the work of CAPA, which is the community approach to planning Prince Avenue. And one of their ideas was to establish a walking tour. And they even came up with a name called Footprints, which I thought was a great great name for a walking tour on Prince. So I just started gathering bits and pieces of information about Prince Avenue. And, and Gary Doster and Charlotte and Stephen Brown um, were my first sort of go-to people for just getting the basics of information uh, on Prince Avenue. And then um, when this book started becoming developed and uh, they thought that maybe Prince Avenue would be a good section, um, Pete McComas and I kind of joined forces and we started looking at history of houses on Prince Avenue, and it's gone, undergone a significant transformation over the years, and especially when we, Stephen just showed us the 1946 aerial map. The house was pretty, the street was pretty much as it was for 
you know, 50 years, 100 years before that. This was right before the 50s and 60s um, and the, the post-World War II boom and, and the economy and the redevelopment on Prince Avenue. So I'm going to, um, so, so we focus basically on the houses that are no longer there, the, the, the ones we don't know of, the, the people who lived in them, who were the movers and shakers of Athens, truly, um, professors, bankers, merchants, um, attorneys. And so I'm going to read to you from page 293, if you have your books with you. And this is on the Flanagan home. The Flanagan home was uh, where the gas station is on the corner of Barber and Prince Avenue. Um, in fact, there were three homes between the Emanuel Episcopal <coughs> Church and Barber Street. It's a very, seems like a very, you know, modest stretch of land there, but there were three beautiful homes. And this was a beautiful Victorian. The, this is a 424 Prince Avenue. The Victorian home of Cameron Douglas Flanagan was located on the northwest corner of Barber Street and Prince Avenue. Flanagan was born in 1854 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the son of Scottish immigrants. He graduated from the Polytechnic College of the state of Pennsylvania with a mechanical engineering degree, then served an apprenticeship and worked as journeyman at a Philadelphia machine shop. In 1879, when he was in his 20s, he moved to Athens, Georgia. He first served as manager of the Athens Gas Light Company, but spent the majority of his career operating the Athens Railway and Electric Company, previously the Athens Electric Railway Company, having helped save that company from receivership in 1893. Flanagan served as general manager, vice president, and president through the company's many incarnations. The Athens Railway and Electric Company was ultimately succeeded by the Georgia Power Company, which opened its Athens office in March 1927. The genesis of the Athens Railway and Electric Company was a streetcar business that was founded in December 1885 by George M. Snodgrass of Texas. Snodgrass used a team of small Texas mules to pull four streetcars, the Lucy Cobb, the Pocahontas, number two, and number four. Snodgrass was, I guess they ran out of names by that time. <laughs> Snodgrass was bought out in August 1886, and in January 1890, two new cars, the W.S. Holman and the Moselle, named for the daughter of E.C. Harris, who is president of the railway, were added. The streetcar service was converted to electric power when that became available in Athens in 1896. The company slowly evolved over time from local transportation to the provision of electrical energy. Flanagan moved one of Snodgrass's original streetcars to his property on Prince Avenue where it was used as a playhouse for his children. In 1886, he married Mary Eliza Nevitt, whose family owned the land on which their house was built. The Nevitt home, um, some of you may, there's a picture in the house, in fact there's two pictures in the book of that house, um, and the Nevitts were an old family and um, had come to Athens, and they have a fascinating story too, but that's their daughter married uh, Cameron Flanagan, actually he was known as Douglas. He married Mary Eliza Nevitt, the father of five children. Flanagan served on the Athens City School Board for 36 years, holding the position of secretary for most of that time. He retired in 1923, soon after Chase Street School was built. The school was originally named the C.D. Flanagan School, as evidenced by newspaper articles, city directory information, and a Sanborn fire insurance map. It is not known why the school was renamed Chase Street Elementary. It's interesting, I ran across a newspaper article in which uh, Oconee Street School was the Louis Lane School. Um, of course, the, the Barrow Elementary School, um, Chase Street was Flanagan School. And of the schools, I'm not sure why, but they all reverted to their street name and only the Barrow School retained the name of the actual person. Flanagan was active in numerous business and civic organizations, serving as president of the Chamber of Commerce and a chairman of the Clark County World War I Savings Committee. The Flanagan home was designed by Mary Flanagan's brother, John J. Nevitt, an architect who lived in Savannah. It was constructed in 1888 for $7,000. It was a beautiful Queen Anne uh, Victorian home. Mary Flanagan died in 1910, and her husband continued to live at the Prince Avenue residence until 1931 with his unmarried daughter, Jean Nevitt Flanagan. And I think some of you may remember her. I know Pat Cooper did. 
She was a graduate of the Lucy Cobb Institute. She studied art in Pennsylvania and later enrolled in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in 1943. She was an accomplished artist and a founding member of the Athens Art Association, formed in 1910. Jean returned to Flanagan, or excuse me, Jean returned to Athens and was honored with an exhibit by the Athens Historical Society and the Athens Clark County Library not long before her death in 1994 at age 96. The house was demolished in the early 1950s and a gas station was built on the site. And Pat Cooper relayed a story that Jean had told her when she was a child and the, uh, there were still horses that were drawing a fire wagon to the fire hall which was across the street from her home and it was a daily ritual for the children in the neighborhood to come watch the drills. And I think that, if, if I remember right, it's basically that the horses were inside the building and they, the harnesses were suspended and they had to be dropped quickly so the horses would not, you know, be surprised this drill was run and then they would be run out. And so it was a favorite pastime for the children to come watch this. It was just yes, a charming story. They called it that they would go over and watch the horses jump to harness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they had a, a black and a white horse. In fact, we have a photo of that, and they were named Blackie and Whitey. Thank you. We're going to talk about the three Ohio people. Three of the names on the cover uh, are people who have Ohio roots, yeah. including Pat and the indispensable Stephen Brown yes. from Columbus. As uh, Milton looked down one day at the list of names and he said, my goodness, the first three names on this book are Ohioans. <laughs> it shows you that Athens always welcomes you coming to that's, town. That's but right. I also have Georgia roots. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it, Prince Avenue is a very long street and it took four more of us to get it finished. Uh, Theresa Flynn is one of those important four. So, Theresa, come tell us some more about Prince Avenue. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you about is something that happened very late in the game. And late enough in the game that when I went back to look, more than half of the Prince Avenue chapter, it's about 100 pages long, have been painstakingly laid out and captioned by Ken um, when we found this piece of information <laughs> and needed somewhere to put it. Um, but it began with, um, in the Prince Avenue chapter, you will find captions that do a nice job of doing architectural description um, that were uh, given to us by John Cassane. And he had emailed Charlotte and told her that on the front of 599 Prince Avenue, which is known as the James Jones Taylor House, although it should be noted he only lived there for about eight years before he died, um, that that curved portico on the front, it looks like the front of the Lipscomb House that's on Millage, uh, that was a definitely after 1890s front. Um, and Charlotte just had never done work on the house um, after 1870. So she sends email, this is around, so John tells her this on January 13th. A couple days later, Charlotte sends email to a bunch of us, kind of some updates about what's going on with the different parts of the chapter. And then, and I'm gonna start, a lot of you know that Charlotte calls Sylvanus Morris, Mr. Sylvie, the author of Strolls Around Athens, so that's what this is. But so she says she's, today I plan to do deed work on 599 Prince. It appears to be owned by J.A. Fowler, about whom I can find little, when Mr. Sylvie took his stroll, and Mr. Sylvie didn't pay him much mind either. This is really rather strange when you consider that the facade was relatively new then. Why didn't Mr. Sylvie comment on it? Did he find it too aggressive, too boastful? Somebody had a lot of money to spend, and evidently they were creating an image. A couple hours later, Stephen responds and says, you might be right about Mr. Sylvie being judgmental about the grandiose. His house was remarkably plain, especially with Hull's mansion across the street, but Mr. Sylvie couldn't have added a portico without moving into Deering Street. And what Stephen had found was that, essentially, he, got, he consulted the Fireborn uh, fire insurance maps, Sanborn fire insurance maps, and what he found was they came out in 1908, the next one comes out in 1913. The house pretty much doubles in size during that time period. We don't know if the original was knocked down or if it was built on top of and around it, but it, it's twice as large. So 
Charlotte goes to the Heritage Room and she's going to be doing deed work. Those of us who aren't in the Heritage Room start looking at when things are changing and I'm looking in the census to see what I can find about J.A. Fowler um, and city directories. So I go and I look in there and I find, oh, well, when he, in 1880, in 19, you know, in 1880, he's listed as being 28 years old. He's living in Hall County. He lives next door to a barkeep, but he, his occupation is given as a retired bartender. At 28 in 1880. So if you know me at all, you know that I know a little bit about liquor in Athens and vice in Athens and the sporting fun to be had in Athens around the turn of the century. And 18, 1908 is a big year. 1908 is the year, January 1st of that year, Georgia enacts prohibition. So it seemed kind of coincidental to me. Um, so. I also go and I look and I see, around 1910, he's not even living in the house on Jefferson, um, you know, he's living on Jefferson Road in a house that he owns outright. But the house on Prince doesn't look like it's occupied. Stephen's also looking at city directories and he's like, yeah, I think maybe they moved out of the house at that time. We both come to our own separate conclusions, consulting our own records that must have done the renovation around 1910 because Stephen and I both look in the digital papers and we see that he's renting out by the end of 1910 that house he owns on Jefferson, um, Jefferson Road. And then I find a clipping for an ad for a liquor dealer um, outside of Athens. This is before prohibition goes into effect. So this is around 1902 when Athens has its own dispensary about John A. Fowler's sweet mash corn whiskey all caps in the ad, made at Athens, Georgia. It's two ten dollars for a gallon, but if you bought more than a gallon, it was only $2 a gallon. Um, and then I find that he's buried in a Catholic cemetery. He has a wife who's about 20 years younger than him. She's Catholic, too. Um, and Charlotte gets back from the Heritage Room. <laughs> she sends this email and says, that man arrived in 1882 and said about buying and selling like a fantasy. So... We're looking into this, we're piecing all the things together. As Stephen notes, it's not clear that J.A. ever committed crimes, but he did prove that liquor pays. And what we really found was when he probably made a lot of his money was when he, in 1885, Georgia passed a law that states, each county could decide to vote if they want a prohibition in their county. You could be a dry county. And this is all the rage in different Georgia counties. And the Athens newspaper, Pretty much most of 1884 and 1885 is talking about what a moral and upstanding place we would be if we followed the lead of some of these other places that are doing this. So they voted in, in 1886. So J.A. Fowler opens his distillery in Oconee County. And the Athens papers are not pleased. Um, it's noted that he has been making three barrels of whiskey a day and is reputed to have increased his fortune by $10,000. And the part about this that annoys the Athens newspapers, can keep in mind none of these articles are signed, is Athens doesn't see a cent of this. Athens is upset that they cannot tax this money. So a few years later, we apparently vote and decide, you know what's not really working out? Prohibition. You know what we should do? Open our own distillery, and we'll just pay. If you want liquor in Athens, you have to buy it from the county. Um, and it's actually you were buying it from the city, because the county had to take the city to the Georgia Supreme Court to say, you know what? You've got to put some of this money in our roads and schools, because we're drinking, too. So, um, but, you know, that, so, all of this goes on. We find out where he is. We find out where they're living. Charlotte finds an obituary that finds his wife was very active in the doing work with the Catholic Church. But you know, in the times that we're looking, you know, St. Joseph's didn't have a parish. They didn't really have a they didn't have a resident priest until 1911. So, and Catholics don't they don't advertise social work, and she's not in a reputable position um, necessarily with her husband doing what he does, and the fact that. He is buying and selling a lot of land. He's investing in some things. There's a lot of court cases that can be a little hard to follow about what he's accused of doing. At one point, he is accused of selling liquor from his premises. And we don't know if that means the Jefferson Roadhouse or if it means uh, 599 prints. Um, and Stephen figured out, looking at maps, 
that the distillery um, was probably located just south of the lake at the Athens Country Club. Um, it's based at, you know, he found this article about a railroad extension and it said it will junction with the seaboard at Fowler's Distillery. And if you look at that location on 20th century maps, it's called Fowler Junction. So um, there was nothing about them in the society with a capital S page, but he was apparently very important to Athens society with the smaller S, <laughs> um, which in my mind is the more important society anyway. Um, so this paragraph, so we find all of this out in January. The, the essay's been done, okay? It's been laid out. It's laid, it's done. Um, it's 100 pages. This is not near the end of the essay. Um, poor Ken would have had to redo the entire essay for us to put a whole lot in there. So Charlotte does a lovely job of condensing what I told you into this paragraph that appears on page 306. <laughs> Um, in a space where if you look at it, you can see how originally that was supposed to have like some very cleansing white space to it. Um, <laughs> the search for the owner who added the flamboyant Corinthian porch was, the last, was one of the last journeys of discovery associated with this essay. Oddly, books about landmark Athens houses do not mention the renovation, and the newspapers are reticent about the owner who affected the change. The addition is similar to houses at 285 and 397 South Millage Avenue. Sanborn fire insurance maps show that the neoclassical facade and other changes were added between 1908 and 1913. The owner, John A. Fowler, was living in Hall County in 1880 and gave his occupation as retired bartender at 28 on that census. By 1882, he was in Athens buying property, so much that it is difficult to know exactly when he bought this house. He owned it in the late 1890s when he married Elizabeth Ahern of Washington, Georgia. Athens newspapers informed that his sweet mash corn whiskey was produced at a distillery located in the vicinity of the lake at the present Athens Country Club. During Clark County Prohibition, he had bar rooms in adjoining counties, and there were regular articles about too much money flowing out of Athens to buy Fowler's liquor to illegally consume in Athens. John A. Fowler died in 1919 and was buried in St. Patrick's Cemetery in Washington, Georgia. Mrs. Fowler died unexpectedly following surgery in 1930. Her Heinz nephew and nieces inherited the house. And one of her nieces stayed in that house until uh, one of a fraternity moved in for a little while. And then I think it was Prince Avenue Baptist who bought it from the fraternity. And now it is a lovely parking lot of Prince Avenue. <laughs> But Teresa's sharing that email, uh, that succession of emails, sort of lets you know how the book developed. But it was wonderful that we had email because we could just fire things back and forth. And in addition to Stephen sending us these marvelous answers, he also has the most wicked wit <laughs> that kept us up and working all the time. And so Stephen, I'll just call on you to come next. He also has a very keen eye for architectural detail, and he would see things in the pictures at the Hargret that were unlabeled. And he would say, Charlotte, I believe, if you will look at this. And so we would look at this, and we would compare it, and so forth, and it became something that's in the book. So Stephen, come tell us about it. And just tell us something about that, and then you're going to leave your book. Redeem, redeem yeah, I book. will. <laughs> okay. And he's going to tell us something from Hubert, right? Yes, yes. Uh, since I really didn't write anything for this book, I just meddled with everything else in it. I thought this was going to be an easy season. I'd just get to go around with all these very scholarly people and eat. But no, uh, Charlotte doesn't let anybody get off quite that easily. So I've been asked to read, unfortunately, one of our really great authors, and as you heard, pretty much the kickoff of this project, uh, Hubert McAlexander cannot be here with us today, so I definitely wanted to read something from Hubert's chapters for you. Now, one of the sad tasks that falls to archivists, I work at the Hargret Rare Book and Manuscript Library, uh, something I face, something my colleagues like Angela Stanley and Laura Williams, Teresa Flynn have dealt with at the Heritage Room here is 
we often have to just rain on people's parades when they have a wonderful, wonderful little story to tell, and it just ain't true. Uh, <laughs> what Thomas Henry Huxley calls the great tragedy of science, a beautiful theory killed by an ugly little fact. Um, <laughs> Well, one of the great things this book accomplishes is uh, all of these folks up here on the stage and not on this stage who worked with the book, I've gotten to know them at the Harvard because they come in chasing down the real story behind things and they solve all sorts of mysteries and clarify. And this book set out to clarify all sorts of things. I think nobody set out with greater zeal than Hubert to clarify some of these long-standing stories. And he has two really great chapters in there, more than two chapters, but two really great ones. Charlotte, as you know, wrote about the bookends of Athens, uh, Thomas Street and Pulaski. Hubert bookended the bookends by going to our earliest street on Oconee, clearing up some mysteries and misattributions, and to the far west, out on Deering, beyond Pulaski Street. And I want to turn to his Pulaski chapter for a short reading, uh, which will, of course, demolish one of our favorite Athens myths. Now, don't worry, yes, Virginia, there is a double-barreled cannon. This deals with something else, and I read. At the convergence of Finley and Deering Streets is a well-known Athens attraction, what editor Larry Gant had called in the August 12, 1890 issue of the Athens banner, The Tree That Owns Itself. No one now knows why Gant concocted the legend exactly when he did. There was no immediate threat, but Athens was on the threshold of becoming a city with future growth in the offering, and this tree was a massive and magnificent specimen standing near the middle of a projected street on the grid. According to the piece, Colonel William H. Jackson, a professor at the university who owned the land on which the tree stood, deeded the space to the tree itself. The tree could never be removed. No matter that Gant had confused and conflated various Jacksons and had not gotten the chronology or, sadly, the ownership of the land right, people were utterly charmed by the tale. Eventually, in 1907, the great benefactor of Athens and the university, George Foster Peabody, who just happened to be starting a forestry school over there at that time, enclosed the tree's space with concrete posts linked with iron chains and placed a memorial marker. During a 1942 storm, the giant tree fell, but in 1946, the Junior Ladies Garden Club planted the sapling of the oak. Today, it towers again over the convergence of Deering and Findlay. So, once again, a shaky bit of history there. Now, I, I see some tears. I don't want to leave you on an unhappy <laughs> note. Uh, so let me give uh, a, a true fact that Hubert dug up. You've heard that much of this essay revolves around moving houses. And everybody has houses that move, including Hubert, on both streets. I think Hubert is the only one who has a piece about a street that moved. And I'm not talking about rerouting here. I'm talking about the street literally getting up and moving. And I read, this is dedicated to anybody who has ever chipped a tooth coming up the hill on Finley from Broad to Deering. <laughs> well known by all who visit Athens, the steep lane that climbs Finley Street from Broad Street to the tree has a Belgian block surface, the last remaining in the city. A road building material considered superior to cobblestone, Belgian block was introduced in New York about 1850. The original blocks were cut from the Palisades of New Jersey. The Athens Weekly Banner of May 28, 1907 noted that a decade before, the only paving in the street was the little strip of Belgian block on Broad Street at the Georgia Depot Hill. Alice Rowland Jacobs, who grew up on Deering Street, remembered that the Belgian block on the steep grade of Finley had been dug up from either Lumpkin or Hancock when those streets were given their modern paving. The archaic surface adds to the ambiance of the hillside, sometimes painfully to the ambiance of the hillside if your shock absorbers are shot. But uh, those are two nice stories from Hubert. I would like to end, though, with one more correction. Uh, this is an old Athens tradition that goes back nearly a month to when, so. yes, it, 
short one day of right. being a really old tradition when uh, Teresa and I were giving a tour of uh, Deering Street and stopped out in front of Hubert and Patrick Alexander's house. Uh, Hubert, as you may know, in addition to being a literary critic, uh, is also um, a specialist on the old Athens Botanical Garden and all these houses. And one of the things that he really focused on at the time that he had the marker put up at the Botanical Garden was his outrage at the tendency of the community to start calling that mighty watershed so influential in the Western history of Athens, Tanyard Creek. Now, Tanyard Creek, Creek, it's a... Uh, it's a Hoosier word, and I'm from Ohio, so I know that. Uh, he did not think that was right, and he would always insist that it must be called by its real name, the Tanyard Branch. Now, Hubert can't be here today, but for the sake of his knowledge, I would like you all to participate with this book's authors here in a correction of a miss appropriation of Athens history and error in Athens history. On the count of three, would you please all join me in saying Tanyard Branch? One, two, three. Tanyard Tanyard Branch. You are now all authorized as evangelists for (laughs) Hubert McAlexander. Go forth and label it correctly. Thank you. Well, that will give you some idea of what his emails are like. (laughs) And the only person that can follow him is Gary Dosta, who has meant so much to this book. And Gary has chosen some different selections from what he did at our last presentation, so it will be a surprise to me. He found a lot of wonderful things beyond images to go in this book. Charlotte, I'd like to really surprise you. I know what you're going to do, but you may not do it. Come on. Let's have mercy on these poor people. Just let me decline. It's it's full time. No. You you, you can have your time. Well, I promise you I'm going to make it short and sweet. And I'm not going to do something different. I'm going to do one that I've already done, but I'm going to do it. The, do the it short so one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm not going to do it. I don't have it. <laughs> I don't have the one I was going to give. Okay. I'm going to give you a quick one here. I'm, I'm going to read a few lines from the uh, chapter 19th century Views of Athens, which begins on page 47. And this chapter is comprised of observations of Athens taken from other publications written long ago. Adel Sherwood was a clergyman and educator, and by the way, he was also the postmaster at Skull Shoals in Green County in 1827. And uh, uh, he's best remembered for his Gazetteer, the state of Georgia, first published in 1827, with subsequent editions in 1829, 1837, and 1860. Now, I used his 1829 edition because I just happened to own a copy of it. It's easier to use mine than to go to the library. But his description of Athens included the observation that there were about 85 elegant dwellings in the city, chiefly two stories high and with but very few exceptions painted white. And here I'll quote Sherwood. Indeed, if in any part of the state we might look for a display of good taste in the appearance of a town, it would be at the seat of literature. A mighty change has taken place in Athens since 1819. Then it contained about 32 houses. And Sherwood then reported that in 1801, there were but two houses in Athens. In June 1828, Athens contained 1,100 souls, 583 whites, including the college students, and 517 blacks. There were at this time also 26 four-wheel carriages and as many gigs and sulkies in Athens. There's a great deal more information in this article, but you'll just have to buy the book and read it. (laughs) Uh, If anybody has a general question or comment that you want to pose, we will accept it. But if you don't, we will go directly to the reception and the book signing. Anything for the good of the group? 
Okay, then you can ask the individuals. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you.